a joint meeting with the History Club here at the Annandale campus. I'm Dr. Salvi, I'm one of the faculty sponsors for the History Club. Just very briefly, you don't have to worry about any sign-ins, we'll take care of that afterwards. I'm going to hand it over to Professor Chabot, who will introduce the uh, speaker and tell you about the series. And afterwards, we will do our History Club business from uh, 2 o'clock onwards. So Dr. Chabot. Professor Chabot. Not a doctor. <laughs> okay. uh, hi everybody, welcome. It's so exciting to see so many people here on campus for this really important topic. Professor Moore is our first speaker in a series of talks that we have this semester to examine a number of really important um, aspects of white supremacy. And I hope that I can see you again at another talk. Professor Moore graduated from NOVA in 2009. He is now working on his PhD at American University and has spent a lot of time conducting research on this topic. I would appreciate your attention and your presence during the entire talk. We expect it to be about an hour. And then afterwards, you're welcome to stay to chat with Professor Moore and meet with the History Club. So I will now turn it over to Professor Nathan Moore. All right, thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for everybody coming out today to hear about this really important but dark topic. I'm gonna dive right into it because I really wanna try to keep this one hour long. I have a lot of information I wanna talk about and I'm gonna talk really fast. So I'm gonna cram a lot in there and hopefully we can really have some good discussions. The title of the presentation today is The Birth of American Terrorism, White Supremacy and Lynching in the United States. Before we get started, there's a few important points that I have to go over. We are going to be hearing a lot of extremely graphic, disturbing, violent language. This is language that comes directly from the newspaper reports during these time periods. So we're going to be treating this horrific language as a primary source to understand what was going on during this period of lynching. We're also going to come in contact with extremely racist language. And once again, we're going to be looking at the language these people use during this time period to try to understand their culture and their society. I myself will not be using any type of racial slurs whatsoever, but I will be including them on the screen when they take part in a primary source document. So if a historical newspaper uses certain racial slurs, I will include them on the screen. The only word that I will be using is the historical term Negro to talk about some of these historical newspaper articles. Most importantly, we are going to be looking at a lot of really extremely violent images today. And this is the place to do it. We're on a college campus. This is an academic scholarly setting. But I do want to warn you, these are really, really brutal images to look at. Please feel free to turn your eyes away from the screen or something like that if it gets too upsetting. But once again, these are primary source documents. And this is the number one central way that we can understand what was happening during this period of lynching by looking at the images. So why am I here today? I'm here today talking to you because if you've been watching the news like I have, you've been hearing a lot about white supremacy. You've been hearing a lot about white nationalism, white power ideology. Most of the current Democrat presidential candidates call President Trump a white supremacist. Some people have said that his rhetoric directly led to the El Paso shooting where a white supremacist committed a domestic terrorist act and killed people. So we've been seeing more of these mass shootings these white supremacist people who go out and commit these acts of violence against people of color, they post racist manifestos online talking about how they hate immigrants, hate black people. So this is something that's out there. This is something that is serious. It's something that we should be paying attention to. It is a threat. White supremacy is extremely dangerous. And as a historian, the way that I understand what's going on today is I have to look in the past. I have to find the historical roots of what this is. When we start looking at these current mass shootings and these white supremacist domestic terrorist attacks, there's a word that kept popping up in these articles, lynchings. In this article from CNN, the El Paso attack was a modern day lynching. One of my professors at American University, Ibram X. Kendi, after the El Paso shooting wrote an article titled, A Lynch Mob of One, The Assault Rifle Has Enabled Racists to Act Alone. This presentation today is trying to figure out what is this word? What does it mean? What is its history? Lynching. What we're going to discover when we dig into the history of lynching is that this is the first form of domestic American terrorism. 
lynching wasn't committed by individuals. It wasn't committed by extremists on the fringe of society. It was committed by entire communities, an entire culture, and an entire country. Where did the word lynching come from? Right here in Virginia. Like so much of this country's racist and slave history, right here in Virginia is where the word lynching was created. Has anybody ever driven past Lynchburg? That's the family where lynching comes from. James Lynch founded Lynchburg. His brother, Charles Lynch, was a plantation owner who made his living off of enslaved labor. Charles Lynch, during the American Revolutionary War, decided to create a local militia. What he wanted to do was go around and punish loyalists, or people who were still loyal to Great Britain. Here's what he did. Charles Lynch would take his militia, find someone who still supported Great Britain, take them, tie them to a tree, and have them whipped. No trial, no type of semblance of law. It was punishment right on the spot. So people started hearing about this, and they liked this. They called it Lynch's Law, punishing someone right on the spot with no semblance of authority, law, or any type of trial whatsoever. They would say Lynch Law has been here, Judge Lynch. Thomas Jefferson even wrote about this in his letters and approved of this. And it wasn't too long to when they shortened it to just lynching. And it wasn't long after that, whenever white mobs would go out and kill black people to reassert white supremacy, that people started to use that word lynching in connection with this. And very uh, shortly after this, the word lynching would solely be associated with white mobs in America killing black people. So when you look in the history of the historical news uh, database, you start to see hundreds and then thousands of articles just like this. Two Negroes lynched. Negro boy lynched by Georgia Crowd. Lynching in Virginia, a day and night of bloodshed. Lynch them, the cry, which is a cry that would be heard thousands of nights all throughout American history. So even though the word lynching started off meaning just punishing somebody without any type of trial, it very quickly came to mean killing someone without a trial. Murder by a mob. And these type of murders could take place with hangings, shootings, burnings, drownings. And one of the most important things to stress is that even though people of all races, all ethnicities, and all backgrounds were lynched, they were killed by this type of vigilante justice, 72% of all lynchings were directed against African Americans. 72%. In places like Georgia, 95% of all lynchings were against black people. So what this tells us is that this was a specific form of racial terrorism directed at the black community. Here are the best numbers that we have so far, and these numbers are constantly changing. A lot of these killings weren't reported, and every time we go back, we find more information. But right now, we can say from 1865 to 1965, up to 5,000 African Americans were killed by white mobs in the United States. From 1883 to 1922, there were no less than 50 lynchings every year. 1890 was the worst decade. Every single year in that decade had over 100 killings, with the worst being 1892 with 161 killings. It took until 1936 for lynchings to get below 10 a year. They continued until the 1960s, and some people even say the last lynching took place in 1981, while others say lynchings continue to take place in other forms today. This was not a Southern phenomenon. This was not only taking place in former Confederate states. This was taking place across every state in the United States. It was a national phenomenon. Only four states reported no lynchings. Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont. Most tragically and disturbingly about this, 99% of all killers in these crimes went away free. No human being was ever charged with a crime for these killings. Most recently, the biggest research project to look at this topic was the Equal Justice Initiative that produced a report in 2015, looking at a few states, and what they found when they did their research was 800 more lynchings than had previously been reported. Every time we go back and dig a little bit more, we find more and more of these stories. Here's a couple of uh, pieces of data from their studies. You can see Mississippi led the nation with 614 lynchings, Louisiana, Georgia. The Equal Justice Initiative teamed up with Google to create an interactive map called Lynching in America, where you can go in and each one of these dots is a story. It's a human being that was killed by a white mob. You can zoom in, read about their names, their lives, and once you start going onto this website and looking at this, you start to realize that this didn't happen some far place away. This happened right here in our communities, in our towns, in our neighborhoods, in our streets, in our cities. 
Nicholas Creary, historian, said, people tend to think something as terrible as lynching must have happened long ago and far away, but it took place right here. It took place right here, literally right here, in the area that we live in. Maryland had 50 lynchings. Virginia had over 100 lynchings. Here's a map right here showing some of these sites. And you would never know that these events took place when you're walking along these areas. You know, Maryland, you're a nice place. You go there, you don't realize 1897, Princess Anne, Negro beaten into insensibility and hanged. This uh, site right here, this is in Annapolis Creek, uh, College Creek in Annapolis, Maryland. This is a beautiful park. People go there to walk their dogs, ride their bikes, and things like this. This is a lynching site. This is a site where a teenage boy was kidnapped by a white mob and hung from a tree. In 2001, they got their first uh, historical marker uh, referencing this event. Anybody ever been to King Street, Alexandria? Yeah. King Street? Yeah, it's a good place. Got lots of food, ice cream, and stuff like that. Fun place to go. When you go to King Street, King Street has very deep slave roots. Um, right off of King Street is a building. Today, it's called the Freedom House Museum. It used to be a slave auction house. You can see here, Price, Birch & Co., Dealers and Slaves. That building is still there today. You can walk into that building. It's a museum. Um, but when you're walking down King Street, it, it's like that history is, is kind of it's kind of pushed under the rug a little bit. Um, you've got pizza places, you've got family places to go. And one thing that isn't mentioned there is the fact that there was a brutal lynching that took place in 1899 right at the corner of King and Fairfax Street. I recently went to this exact site. Um, this is what it looks like today. There is literally no mention of the, uh, the boy that was killed here. There are people they go, they take pictures there. So what I want to do, I want to read you the newspaper reports of what happened to Benjamin Thomas in 1899 on King Street in Alexandria. So Thomas was between 16 and 20 years old, and he was accused of assaulting a white woman. We'll never know whether or not this is a true crime or not. So here's what the newspaper report said. When Thomas was arrested and placed in jail, the lynch mob began forming outside its doors at 11 a.m. When its numbers reached over 1,000, Alexandria's mayor, George L. Simpson, tried to disperse the crowd by telling them that a fair trial would be held that day, and he promised them that if this is not done, I will give you my word, as a man of honor, that I will personally lead a mob tomorrow to lynch Thomas. His words had no effect. The mob surged into the jail using axes, bars, rams, and every available weapon to break down the iron doors. The mob leaders eventually found a scared Thomas hiding in the jail cellar and dragged him out into the streets to loud cheers. Even though several people shouted that they had the wrong man, a noose was quickly thrown over his head and he was dragged for six or seven blocks down St. Affeth Street to King Street, from King Street down to Fairfax. One report noted that Thomas's cries and moans were heartrending, but the mob was relentless. Down to King Street, the crowd proceeded, shouting and firing pistols into the air. Several people held onto the rope that was pulling Thomas down the street as he was chased by a screaming mob. And in the tussle, every bit of clothing was torn from his body with the exception of his shoes. His cries and moans were pitiful, but they were not heeded. His body was horribly maimed by the rough cobblestones. When they reached their destination, Thomas was quickly strung up to a lamppost before the howling mob. His body was perfectly nude as he hung there, writhing in the agonies of death. After 15 minutes of watching Thomas struggle and choke, someone shouted to the men, line up, and the order was given to fire, and a dozen or more shots were fired at the dangling form. Several of these took effect in his body, but still he con uh, continued to move unconsciously. It was 20 minutes before Thomas was finally cut down, still clinging to life, when the crowd rushed upon him, beating and kicking him. This procedure continued for a moment when a member of the mob stepped forward from the crowd and placing his weapons to the breast of the Negro, fired a shot which ended his existence. After the lynching, several of the spectators, exhibiting an unnatural fury, then rushed to the spot, eagerly striving for relics of the death in the shapes of bits of rope. The Washington Post reported that the mob that swung the Negro was for the most part an orderly one and comprised many of the leading citizens. As many as 2,000 citizens of Alexandria watched Thomas be beaten and killed in the streets that day. When the Richmond Planet reported on the lynching, they wrote, Within sight of the capital of Washington, within eight miles of the official residence of the President of the United States, Tuesday, August 5th, 1899, in the city of Alexandria, on the soil of Old Virginia, the naked body of a man, a colored man, was seen hanging from a lamppost. He had been lynched by some of the best citizens of this quaint old town. That's the story of Benjamin Thomas. There is no mention of this. 
If you go there now, there's a farmer's market on Saturdays and Sundays. Next weekend, for the first time, the Equal Justice Initiative is holding a community meeting to talk about putting up the memorial of Benjamin Thomas, who was lynched by a white mob. Needless to say, I will be at this meeting, September 21st, arguing that we need these memorials. We need to remember and, and confront this history, which is something we have not done for a long time in this country. For a long time in this country, lynchings were whispered. They were not included in historical narratives and history classrooms and documentaries and movies. It was something that we were ashamed of. This all started to change in 2002 with an exhibit called Without Sanctuary, Lynching Photography in America. And I have two books over here, you feel free to look at them afterwards, that contain all the pictures included in that project. So the curator of this project, James Allen, went around the country and collected the most extensive, extensive collection of lynching photography, lynching photographs, and lynching souvenirs and put them into an exhibit in museums around the country. And this was the first time a lot of people were coming face to face and seeing these pictures for the first time. Pictures like this. This is a picture we'll look at later, but you can see the person who went to the lynching actually took hair from the person and kept it with them as a keepsake. These are the types of pictures that people saw for the first time in 2002 with this exhibit called Without Sanctuary. And we're gonna be looking at a lot of these pictures today because I think it's extremely important. Someone wanted to take these pictures. Someone wanted to remember this moment. People came with smiles on their faces to look at these black bodies hanging from trees. So these are the primary source documents that we're going to be dealing with today when we look at this. And when you look at these pictures, it gives you a sense of how they thought about these killings. This is a picture of hunters standing next to their kill from the same time period of this lynching. How they viewed these human beings as animals. They, people at this exhibit saw that they had professional photographers that would come and take before and after pictures of the lynching victims. They would take a picture of you before you were hung and then after you were hung, and these were sold as postcards and given out to family and friends. People saw that the corpses were desecrated even after death. This is a lynching victim who has been painted, had cotton stuck to his face, and someone is off camera propping up his head with a stick so they can pose and take pictures with his dead body. That same year that Without Sanctuary exhibit happened, for the very first time in American history, a lynching conference was held at Emory University in Georgia. 2002, the first time scholars got into a room to talk about this dark history. 90 scholars from around the world. This all led to an amazing moment last year, 2018. 2018, if you can believe this, was the first time ever in the history of this country that we passed an anti-lynching bill through the Senate. Since 1882, this had not happened. 200 bills had gone through the Senate and they'd all been shot down by racist Southern politicians. 2018 was the first time the United States passed a bill that said lynching was a federal crime punishable by the death penalty. So this is an amazing moment, but it's also tragic and ironic because the age of lynching is over. The age of, we needed this law decades ago and the US government did nothing. They never lifted a finger. So this was symbolic to try to atone for those sins. And I think it's extremely important to lift up some of the heroes in this story. One of those heroes is George Henry White. He was an African-American man who's the only African-American man who served in the 55th Congress. He was from uh, North Carolina. He was the first individual to ever put up an anti-lynching bill January 20th, 1900. It took 118 years later for the US Senate to pass that bill. 2018 was a watershed year for a lot of other reasons. 2018 saw the very first lynching memorial and museum open up in the United States. This happened just last year. We got the first memorial and museum in uh, Montgomery, Alabama called the National Memorial for Peace and Justice. When you walk into this museum, the first exhibit you see is a memorial to the victims of lynching. It's over 800 gigantic steel weights that are suspended from the ceiling, and each one of those weights represents a single county in the United States where a lynching took place, and the names of the people are on the weights. This is a really powerful exhibit. The reason why they're hanging above your head is to give you the sensation of being at the public spectacle lynching, of seeing the black bodies hanging from the tree, that position. When you walk in, you read, for the hanged and beaten, for the shot, drowned and burned, the tortured, tormented and terrorized, for those abandoned by the rule of law, we will remember. Some people who went to this, like Ed Sykes, who was 77 years old, looked up and saw his name on one of those memorials and never realized this, just learned this, two of his relatives have been lynched. He never knew this until going into this building. 
this museum completely rewrites American history. When you insert in this, this 100 year period of racial terrorism into American history, it changes everything. And some people don't like that. Some people don't want history to change. Some people were really disgusted by this museum. They said, let sleeping dogs lie. Some people said it's going to cause an uproar, open up old wounds. It's a waste of money, a waste of space, and it's bringing up bullshit, is what they called it. It keeps putting the emphasis on discrimination and cruelty. So this presentation is not me coming up here telling you stuff. I'm asking you a question. The question is, should we remember this history? What do we do with this history? Are these people right? Do we let sleeping dogs lie? Or do we go and we put up these memorials and we address this? If you ask the founder of the museum, Brian Stevenson, here's his answer. Lynching is American history. And for us to recover from that violence and terror, we all have to know that history and we all have to talk about it. And that is exactly what has just started happening within these last few years. North Carolina, 2017, first town hall meeting to discuss memorializing the lynching victims of that county. 2016, Alabama, first lynching memorial. 2018, Georgia, first lynching memorial to the over 500 black people killed in that state. Virginia, April 2019, we got our first lynching memorial to Isaac Brandon. He was a 43-year-old uh, man, father of eight, Mary, who was accused of assaulting a white woman, kidnapped by a white mob, and murdered, and no one was ever charged with a crime. 2019, over 100 years later, we finally have a plaque telling his story. Even closer to home, Loudoun County got the first of three planned memorials for the three victims of lynching in Loudoun County. This was helped put together by the local NAACP. And if you look at this community meeting, some of the responses that people put out there, they said this brings awareness to issues that people either don't know about or that they try to ignore. You don't have to be part of the problem to be part of the solution. Hate crimes are on the rise. Connections to the rest of history. Lynching shouldn't be glossed over. So these are some of the uh, uh, ideas that people had at that meeting. And here was the, uh, the day that the memorial was put up, right off the WNOD bike trail. And it tells the story of Ryan Anderson, who is a 14-year-old black boy. Here's what he was killed by white mobs for. He put a sack on his head and jumped out and said boo to a white girl. Kid joke, and he was murdered for that. He was murdered for scaring a white girl. I think these memorials are so critically important to have up, to remember this history, and here's why. When you visit some of the sites of lynching in this country, there are historical markers there, but they don't talk about the lynching. They talk about the Confederacy. They talk about the white supremacist Confederacy of the United States. So Charlie Hale lynched 1911 Lawrenceville, Georgia. When you go to his lynching site, there's nothing mentioning this, but you have this right there. Lest we forget in remembrance of the men who honorably served in the Confederate States of America. So I think we should switch, bring down the Confederates, start bringing up the, the memorials. Um, and when you look at these primary source evidences, again, when we're treating these pictures of how these people reacted to this, I mean, this is a black boy who's just been hung, chased down by bloodhounds like they're on a hunt, and they're desecrating and mocking him by saying, please do not wake him. Confederate monuments are all over this country. We have white men on horses that wanted to keep black people and slaves everywhere. There are hundreds of them. So we're going through a moment in our history right now where some of these are coming down and lynching memorials are starting to go up. I think this is important because the lynching memorials that are up right now are under attack, such as the Emmett Till Memorial. Anybody ever heard of Emmett Till before? It's a name we should all know. Um, the Emmett Till Memorial has been destroyed three times. Most recently after it was shot to pieces by University of Mississippi students who posted this to their Instagram. They shot it and then they posed with guns. This memorial has been destroyed so many times that they decided recently they had to now make it bulletproof and weighing a couple hundred pounds so people couldn't move it. I think this says a lot about the state of, of this country right now where the memorials to lynching have to be bulletproof so people will stop shooting them. So what is this story that these people don't want us to remember about Emmett Till? This is 1955. Emmett Till was 14 years old. He's a boy from Chicago visiting family in Mississippi. One day he goes to the Bryant grocery store with a couple of friends and his cousin, Simeon Wright. Uh, this is what the store looks like today. It's completely overgrown, no trespassing sign. This is a recreation of the, uh, the Bryant grocery store. So when they were in the store, Carolyn Bryant, a white woman, was at the cash register. Emmett Till bought some food had the regular interaction, paid for his stuff, walked out of the building, never talked to her, never touched her, literally nothing. 
When he got outside of the building, she walked out behind him, and Emmett Till turned around and jokingly whistled at her. Whistled. A small boy whistling. Something silly. His friends, who had grown up in Mississippi, froze dead in their tracks. Simeon Wright later recalled, We all looked at each other, realizing that he had violated a long-standing unwritten rule, a social taboo about conduct between blacks and whites in the South. Suddenly we felt we were in danger, and we stared at each other, all with the same expression of fear and panic. But it never occurred to me that he would be killed for whistling at a white woman. He was. He was brutally murdered. He was kidnapped from his bed, taken to a shed, tortured, brought to a river, shot in the head, and thrown into the river. He was a 14-year-old boy. His killers, the husband of Carolyn Bryant, Roy Bryant, and his brother-in-law, J.W. Millam, they were put on trial and found completely innocent. The next year, here's what they did. They sold their story to a magazine and gloated and bragged about torturing and killing a 14-year-old boy. Openly, no secret. I'm not going to read the language that's up here because it's absolutely disgusting. But this is the man talking about how he brutally tortured and killed a 14-year-old boy in an American newspaper. They called this the approved killing in Mississippi. Approved. Emmett Till's mother made a radical, revolutionary decision that would help spark the civil rights movement. Here's what she said to the coroner. I don't want you to fix my son's face. I want you to put him out for the people to see and show the world what white supremacy looks like, what this hatred has done to my boy. So she had an open funeral in an open casket. 50,000 people went to this funeral and saw the body of Emmett Till that had been torn to pieces by white supremacy. 50,000 people. This helped to spark an international movement, protest, demonstrations across the world. So here's something interesting to think about. This past July, Emmett Till should have been 78. He should be here today. This should, we, we, he should be around. Um, his, his cousin Simeon Wright said he was so funny he probably would have been a famous comedian. So this isn't history. This is an open crime scene that we're dealing with. It's also an open wound that we're still dealing with. Every single time someone puts up lynching images on TV or anything like that, there is always pushback. 60 Minutes recently showed lynching photographs and people got really upset. And one of the descendants of one of these lynching victims said this. I think that seeing what actually happened will open up the eyes of the American people. The same thing that happened with the Emmett Till situation. His mother wanted the world to see what hatred had done. When we're looking at this topic, we have to look. We have to look at the photos, look at the brutality, because that is the only way to understand what this age of racial terrorism was all about. So this lynching came from our history in the United States as a slaveholding country and a country that came up with the ideology of white supremacy. How did white people justify enslaving other human beings? They came up with the idea that these other people were biologically inferior, but also that God himself had made black people inferior and made them the slaves for white people. This is the history of our country. We fought a war over this. We fought a civil war in this country over the soul of America. What would we be? Would we be the slave nation? Would we be the white supremacist nation? Or would we try to live up to the words of Thomas Jefferson, all men are created equal, that we're still trying to live up to today? White supremacy was enshrined in the Confederacy. This is the famous cornerstone speech of the vice president of the Confederacy, Alexander Stevens, who said, the cornerstone of our government rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man, that slavery subordination to the superior race is his natural and normal condition. This is a great physical, philosophical and moral truth. The Confederacy was defeated. The South was defeated. The country was reunified. But did white supremacy die? Absolutely not. It survived, it thrived, and it still exists to this day. One manifestation of it you might know, the KKK, a terrorist group in this country founded in 1865 with the sole goal of putting black people in their place after slavery had been ended. While black people are trying to insert themselves in society and vote and be normal American citizens, their whole goal is to terrorize them and show them that they will never be American citizens in this country. It will always be a white supremacist nation. So they dressed up like ghosts. They went to their houses and burned crosses on their lawns and blew up the churches. Um, they went to voting uh, uh, booths and scared people away from voting and exercising their rights as citizens. And they did lynch. The KKK lynched hundreds and thousands of black people in this country. They broke into their houses and killed them. Here's the important thing to remember about the KKK. They were not a fringe group in this country. They were at the heart of this country. They were normalized. 
1925, the KKK was the biggest grassroots movement the country had ever seen. It had five million members. 30,000 of those members marched through the streets of Washington, D.C. in 1925, and you can see, they're not afraid to show their faces. Here's the important part that I wanna stress. The lynchings that I'm gonna talk about today were not committed by the KKK. Maybe they were a part of it, but these were committed by communities, entire communities, men, women, and children, lawyers, doctors, priests, paper boys, normal people, not extremists. Here's a newspaper article from 1943 saying, these men might ordinarily pass for decent citizens. Each one of these men had been involved in hanging a young black boy from a tree. These are other words to describe the members of a lynch mob I came across in my research. Some of the best men in the county. Men who are considered here to be the best representatives in the community of law, order, and justice. Best citizens. Good Christians. Police officers often participated. They often never tried to stop the lynchings. They would give the lynch mob the jail keys, allow them to go in the jail, find their victim. Sometimes they participated. Sometimes police officers pulled the ropes. Sometimes they directed the traffic for the people that were coming to see the lynching. In this case, one reporter went to this county and said, are you telling me you can't identify this man who's clearly visible in this small county, this police officer who was at this lynching and let it take place? And they said, sorry, we don't know who he is. When lynching victims arrived at the coroner's office and they filled in how did they die, they said death at the, at the hands of persons unknown. They were unknown because they were all known. It was everybody committing this crime, so you couldn't single out one individual. These lynchings were not something that were done away from society, on the fringe of society, in the backwoods, away from where people could see. They were advertised in newspapers like sporting events. You can see here, John Hartfield will be lynched by Ellisville Mob at 5 o'clock this afternoon. They told you where to go, where to park. They served refreshments. You would be able to eat deviled eggs and drink lemonade and eat sandwiches. Um, these uh, places would look like rallies and festivals. People would give speeches. There would be music playing. It was a social gathering. It was a place that people wanted to be. People didn't run away from lynchings. They ran to the lynchings. In 1925, two men were taken out to a field. This is a grainy photo, but here they are, they're being hung. A train was nearby. The train saw what was happening. The conductor stopped the train. Every single human being got off of that train and got a free show for the day. And you can read the paper. Mothers dragged their children out to watch this. 1926, the following year, Kentucky. Another grainy photo. These people are all looking at a lynching. Can you see how packed that square is? There's people cramming the roof. There's people sitting on top of people's shoulders to see this killing. Lynchings were totally approved by society. Little condemnation follows killing of Burns. Preacher is one exception, and usually the preacher was not even the exception. Mainstream politicians defended lynching, like vice presidential candidate John Temple Graves, who said lynching was necessary, whites had a right to lynch, and white moms were needed to protect pure white women against the black beast. Benjamin Tillman, another mainstream politician who went around the country promoting lynching, saying lynch mobs are necessary, we have to have them to protect against the black brutes who are terrorizing our white women. And these are the pictures that would be in the newspaper dehumanizing black people and feeding into this larger message. So protecting white women was a big thing. That was one of the big reasons why these people are, are saying that they're lynching African Americans. And this goes back to slavery and the whole idea of protecting pure white blood. Here are a couple of reasons why young black men were killed in this country. Caleb Gadley was lynched in Kentucky in 1894 for walking behind a white woman. Keith Bowen was lynched in Mississippi in 1889 for accidentally opening the door where three white men, women were and then closing the door and walking away. He was murdered. A man named Lee was killed in South Carolina for knocking on the door of a white woman's house. Thomas Miles was lynched in 1912 for inviting a white woman to have a drink. Jeff Brown was lynched in 1916 for accidentally bumping into a white girl as he ran to catch a train. And Parks Banks was lynched in 1922 for simply having a small picture of a white woman in his pocket. Other reasons why African Americans were killed in this country were breaking white social rules. Jesse Thornton was lynched in Alabama in 1949 for not saying Mr. as he talked to a police officer. You could be killed for speaking disrespectfully for, to whites, arguing with whites, insulting whites, or not even stepping off of the street when a white person was coming in your direction. You could also just be lynched for standing around. 
Howard Smee tells us, the mob wanted the lynching to carry a significance that transcended the specific act of punishment. They turned the act into a symbolic rite in which the black victim became the representative of his race and as such was being disciplined for more than a single crime. The deadly act was a warning to the black population not to challenge the supremacy of the white race. Sometimes all that mattered was dead black bodies. They did not care if the person was completely innocent. In this case, in 1893, they knew they had the wrong man and it did not matter. A young girl said she was assaulted. The mob brought a man in front of her named Peterson and said, is this the man who touched you? She said, no, that is not the man, he did not do it. The mob walked outside, they were frustrated, there was no other black people around, so someone shouted out, Barnwell's reputation is at stake. God damn it, somebody must die for it. So they took him around back and they murdered him. C.J. Miller, 1893, was accused of murder. Before he was hung, he said, I stand here surrounded by men who are excited, men who are not willing to let the law take its course. And as far as crime, the crime is concerned, I have not committed any crime, and certainly no crime gross enough to deprive me of my life and liberty to walk upon the green earth. Two hours later, they discovered he was the wrong man, and they had already killed him. This is a drawing from an investigator reporter on the scene. 1936, another reporting says Lent Shaw, a black man, whose only crime they could find thus far was that of being black, pays with his life the price of white supremacy in Georgia. Lynchings weren't just against black men, they were against the entire black community. Black boys, 14 year olds, young teenagers here in Mississippi, 1942, women, young girls, unborn infants, Pregnant women were killed and had their babies ripped out of their wombs and stomped to death. That is absolutely true. A uh, husband and wife were actually tied together and burned together and hung together. This was launched at every single member of the black community. And it wasn't just the people that they were killing that was receiving the message. It was the children that these people left behind. Their mothers, their sisters, their brothers. How could people do this? How could people kill infants? How did this happen? They did not see black people as people. Here's what they said. The, the people of the South don't think any more of killing black, black fellows than you would think of killing a flea. Here's another man. I was amazed to find scores and hundreds of men who believed the Negro to be a brute and his slaughter nothing more than killing a dog. This picture is one of the most famous lynching pictures in existence and it shows you that casual brutality. 1930, Indiana, Thomas Shipp and Abram Smith were accused of robbery and murder, taken out of the jail cell by a white mob and lynched. And if you look at the faces in the crowd, these people are not disgusted, they're not upset, they're not sad, they're not ashamed, they are ecstatic, they are excited. This is a night on the town. For this couple right here, it is a date night. A boyfriend and girlfriend, a man proudly pointing to the bodies in the trees they had just killed. These are the faces of people looking at these bodies hanging from trees. They're not disgusted. On that night, when these two men were killed, the lynch mob wanted another body. Their bloodlust was not fulfilled with two people. So they decided to go back to the jail. There was a third suspect, a 16-year-old boy named James Jimmy Cameron. They wanted him. So here's what happened. This is Cameron in his memoir. As the mob came back, just then the sheriff was sweating like somebody had thrown a bucket of water on his face. He told the mob leader, get the hell out of here. You already hung two of them, so that ought to satisfy you. Then the mob began to yell for me like a favorite basketball or football player. They chanted, we want Cameron, we want Cameron, we want Cameron. The lynch mob chanting for this. So after they took him outside, here's Cameron again. I looked over to the faces of the people as they were beating me along to the way of the tree. I was pleading for some kind of mercy, looking for a kind face, but I could find none. They got me up to the tree and they got a rope and they put it around my neck and they began to push me under the tree. That's when I prayed to God. I said, Lord, have mercy, forgive me my sins. I was ready to die. Just as they were about to pull him up and hang him and kill him, someone screamed out, he's innocent. He's innocent. And the white lynch mob decided to play God that day, took the rope off his neck and brought him back to his jail cell. He survived. He, up until the day he died, he had a burn mark on his neck from the rope as they were pulling him up. He went on to live an amazing activist life, fighting against discrimination and racism in this country. He founded America's Black Holocaust Museum in Milwaukee. Amazing, amazing individual. If anybody's ever heard the song Strange Fruit by Billie Holiday, I don't have enough time to play it right now. Please listen to it after this class. This song was inspired by this picture. 
after uh, this uh, songwriter saw this picture, he decided to write that song, and then Billie Holiday made it famous. So please, after this presentation, go listen to Strange Fruit. You can hear it on YouTube. You can hear it anywhere, yes, absolutely. So today, in this community, someone decided to put a mural up of those white people. A mural of the people pointing at the bodies, and this pissed a lot of people off. Some people say, this is great, we're talking about things, we need to address this. Other people say, it serves no purpose, it's gonna bring up these bad ideas. And this is the question of this presentation. Should we be talking about this? Should we be dealing with this? How do we talk about this subject? Some people don't want to. Another picture that led to a song is this picture right here in 1911, Oklahoma, where two people were killed, a mother and her son, Laura and her son, L.D. Nelson, hung from a bridge, and a professional photographer was hired to come and take pictures of this. Um, this is a, a really rare picture. This is the only known picture that we have of a female lynching victim. Woody Guthrie, who wrote This Land is Your Land, wrote a song about this after he saw this picture. He was extremely moved by this photograph, but he had another reason for writing, wanting to write a song about this. His dad, Charlie Guthrie, was one of the guys on the bridge. His own father participated in the lynching. The pictures can be empowering uh, of lynching. Uh, in this case, Nichelle Strader, she is a 22-year-old art student in Florida. She wanted to do an art exhibit on lynching, so she went back and started looking at some photos and found this photo right here from 1935. And she was completely horror-stricken when she realized there is a lot of children in this photo. A lot of young children who are six to seven years old, and this girl in particular really horrified her. Because this face, she's smiling. She's looking up at this black body and she's smiling. When Nichelle went home and showed this picture to her mom, her mom got really quiet and said, Nichelle, I've never told you this, but this is your uncle. This is her relative. She never knew this story before. So she painted this picture and called it Uncle Reuben. And in this picture, you can see the only people that have faces are the man who's been lynched and the smiling girl. Children being at lynchings was not the exception, it was the rule. Adults wanted kids to see this and understand of it and approve it and think this was natural and normal. 1895, Virginia. Young boys at the lynching. 1920, Texas. You can see lots of young boys at the front laughing and the feet hanging from the man who's been hung above them. 1910, Texas. Look at how many people have filled this public square to see this man be killed in the middle. People are in the windows of businesses. Young boys there. This is the parade march to that lynching on that day. 1938, 18-year-old um, W.C. Williams, a black man, was lynched. Uh, it, it's a little bit grainy, but there's two boys right here, two teenage boys who are taking turns beating him as he's hanging from the tree. And then later when one of the boys was interviewed, he said, then we rammed a red hot poker into him. When you look at these photographs, you see that this is something people were happy to be at. This is the killing of three black men, 1920 Minnesota. It's a night out on the town for these people. It's something exciting to be a part of. If you didn't know what was happening in this picture, you might say they were at a rock concert, right? Some big kind of festival or rally. These people are packed into this place to see a human being be tortured and killed in front of their eyes. One of the best ways to understand that these lynchings were not something people were ashamed of, that people tried to hide or push on the outskirts of society, is to realize that it wasn't just hangings. Hundreds, if not, if not thousands, of African Americans were burned alive at the stake in the United States of America, within living memory. The NAACP put an ad in 1922 that said, do you know that the United States is the only land on earth where human beings are burned alive at the stake? When you hear about burnings, you might think of the witch trials hundreds of years ago, the Inquisition burning heretics or something like that. You don't think that this happened right here in this country on our streets within living memory, but it absolutely did. Here are some, uh, some common article heading uh, headlines that I saw as I was doing my research for this topic. A Negro burned alive, roasted alive in the presence of a thousand people. Negro dies at stake, burned by mob, body cut into many pieces. Negro boy tortured, tortured and burned, uh, burned at stake. Eager to burn Negro, mob burns three Negroes at stake. Was made a living torch, 2,000 see a man burn. Mob hangs and burns, tourist horror stricken. Boy 15 tortured over slow fire, burning body made target for bullets. Mob now seeks another to be lynched. It goes on and on and on, and it seems to never end when you look at these articles. 
In 1904, Booker T. Washington said, within the last fortnight, three members of my race have been burned at the stake. One of these a woman. In the midst of this nation's busy and prosperous life, few, I fear, take time to consider where these brutal and inhuman practices are leading. The custom of burning human beings has become so common as scarcely to excite interest or attract unusual attention. Burnings were so common people did not talk about them. It wasn't a big event. It was something that happened every other week. They were so common, a nine-year-old boy in 1899 could say, I have seen a man hanged. Now I wish I could see one burned. This is America, where people were burned at the stake in front of thousands of cheering, screaming fans. This picture over here is called Her First Lynching, the mother holding her up to see the burning body. 1926. This happened not even 100 years ago. How long will this go on in civilized America? 1930. A uh, victim of lynching who has been burned. We're just starting to deal with this dark part of our past. Just last year in Colorado, people went to the site of one of these burnings and collected some dirt and soil for a planned memorial. And this was a spot where 16-year-old Preston Porter was burned alive. He had been accused of raping and killing a young girl, something he had nothing to do with. He had a learning disability. He had no idea what was going on the, of the day of the burning, but still in front of thousands of people, they tied him to a stake and lit him on fire at 16 years old. This is something the entire community came out to participate in. The burnings were usually planned for around 2 p.m., broad daylight, good times where people could go and see. Um, Ted Smith in 1908, accused of assaulting a white woman, burned in the public square. These took place in public squares, courthouses, the center of urban communities. They took pictures of the before, setting up the fire, getting ready, during, burning the person, and then afterwards where they would stay from seven to eight hours, sometimes you know, for an entire day, just sitting there poking and burning until there's absolutely nothing left. One of the things you have to realize when you look at these pictures, as can you imagine, first off, being near a person being burned alive and hearing them scream, and then afterwards sticking around and the body burning, the smell, and this is the face that these people have in this event? This is a little bit grainy, but this is a newspaper who said, at Omaha's lynching party, these were the type of people that were there. And look at their faces. It tells us something about the society where people could participate in these events and have those faces. 1933, Lloyd Warner was uh, burned to death in front of 9,000 people. You can see one man who, who wanted to make sure he got his face into the picture. In the case of Henry Smith in Paris, Texas in 1893, he was accused of killing a four-year-old girl, something that we will never know if he committed because the only person who heard, uh, heard his confession were his killers. His killers said, yes, he confessed to the crime. So after Henry Smith was killed, they made a book about it, a whole book. Uh, so people could look at this event and relive this event. So this is the day before the lynching. They built the scaffold preparing for this. This was advertised in newspapers far and wide, and over 10,000 human beings drove to this site to witness this murder. Here are the people that captured and killed him. This is the people that are, uh, are heading to the lynching of that day. Here's what happened when they brought Henry Smith out. It's hard to imagine how he must have felt as he was unloaded off the train and met by this raging sea of hate. The New York Times described how Smith was placed upon a carnival float in mockery of a king on his throne and followed by the immense crowd as he was pushed through the city so that all might see. A witness wrote that awaiting the coming of the awful cavalcade, the sidewalks, windows, awnings, in short, every available inch of space from which a view of the street could be had was filled by a human being. Smith was ridiculed and pelted with stones, spit on, screamed at, scratched, cut, punched. His shirt was ripped from his back. One newspaper said this was a scene that might be several hundred years old, but isn't. This is a modern day American crucifixion. So when Henry Smith was placed upon the scaffold, which they had written the words justice on, justice, before he was burned alive, he was tortured for one hour. For one hour, the men uh, who were torturing him took hot irons, put it on every part of his body, gouged out his eyes, and then stuck hot irons down his throat. After they had tortured him for one hour to the screams and shouts of the crowd, the crowd got to take uh, part and they got to participate by collecting the material to burn him alive. So they all got stuff, put it underneath of them, and set him on fire. And they watched this for hours, 10,000 human beings. 
Another way to understand how people uh, interacted with these events is to realize that people took souvenirs from these killings. People wanted to remember these killings. So here's the case of Sam Hose in 1899, lynched after being accused of assaulting a white woman. So first they mutilated him in front of the audience. The newspaper reports tell us before his death, Hose's body was mutilated with knives and the torture endured for half an hour. A hand grasping a knife shot out and one of the Negro's ears dropped into a hand ready to receive it. Hose pleaded pitifully for mercy and begged his tormentors to let him die. His cries were unheeded. The second ear went the way of the other. Hardly had he been deprived of his organs of hearing than his fingers, one by one, were taken from his hands and passed among members of the yelling and now thoroughly maddened crowd. After his ears, nose, and hands, and fingers, and toes had all been chopped off, after he was dead, his body was cut to pieces and the bones were crushed into bits and distributed to those lucky enough to be first in line, all holding out sacks to receive the bone dust. That night, some lucky treasure hunters were seen walking through the streets carrying bones in their hands. The Washington Post reported how the Negro's heart was cut into several pieces, as was also his liver. Those unable to obtain these ghastly relics direct paid their more fortunate possessors extravagant prices for them. Pieces of bone sold for 25 cents and a piece of liver sold for 20 cents. Down the street, Sam Hose's knuckles were for sale in a grocer's window. One report described how the crowd fought for places about the smoldering tree and with knives secured such pieces of his carcass as had not crumbled away. Then the tree was chopped down and the chips and such pieces of firewood as had not yet been burned were carried away as souvenirs. His entire body was broken into pieces and taken by people as keepsakes. The tree where he was burned at uprooted and taken in any piece of wood, any piece of dirt. People wanted anything connected with this killing to take home and to remember this body. This is something they were proud of, wanted to remember. Here are some pictures um, that were drawn by activists that were trying to fight back against this horrific, um, horrific uh, years of racial terrorism. The case of Jesse Washington is the case of the biggest crowd I have ever seen for a lynching. 15,000 human beings came to Texas in 1916 to see a 17 year old boy with learning disabilities brutally tortured, had his hands cut off, all this type of stuff, and then he was burned at the stake just like so many others. So here we can see the crowd, people on shoulders, and then everybody wanting to get close and to get near the body, get a piece of the body to bring home as a souvenir. And we can look at the faces of the people that are there. How did they react to this? What were they thinking about these killings? We can also look at what they said. Remember, they made these as postcards. This postcard, this man said, this is the barbecue we had last night. They stayed for hours afterwards. It was a big social event for the entire community. L. Persons, uh, just recently, uh, the memorial got put up, 1917, and another person that was burned alive in front of a crowd of thousands of people. And in this case, we can listen to what some of the crowd was saying. They said, burn him, screamed the woman, and burn him slow. Another one said, not to use too much gasoline. He'll burn too fast. He'll burn too fast. They wanted this to last a long time. They wanted the torture and the mutilation, all that to last. The next day after this killing, a preacher gave a sermon, and here's what he said. We burned a Negro at the stake yesterday. Let us underscore the word we. So if we are proud of it, let us be proud of it together. If we are ashamed of it, let us be ashamed of it together. Let's not be cowardly enough to put it off onto something else, claiming that we were at home attending the business. Public opinion burned L persons. The minister of the gospel, the lawyer, the doctor, the newspaper editor, the man who talks to others on the street corner or the streetcar, he shared in it. That is, unless he protested, and there were few protests. The majority approved. The minority kept silent, and silence gives consent. White America was dead silent. Federal government, dead silent. African Americans had to fight for themselves. This woman right here, Ida B. Hell, uh, Ida B. Wells, is my personal hero and an American hero. This is a woman who went out to these places, to these lynching sites, to do investigative reporting to show America what was happening. She traveled around the world, shining light on lynchings, produced books like this, 1892, Southern Horrors, a red record. Here's Ida B. Wells. She said, our country's national crime is lynching. It is not the creature of an hour, or the sudden outburst of uncontrolled fury, or the unspeakable brutality of an insane mob. 
It represents the cool, calculating deliberation of intelligent people who openly avow that there is an unwritten law that justifies them in putting human beings to death without trial by jury, without opportunity to make defense, and without right of appeal. Another uh, amazing African-American woman who fought against lynching was Lucy Parsons. And in the uh, interest of time, I'm not going to read hers. The NAACP was founded in 1909 largely to fight back against this, uh, this racial terrorism. Investigators like Walter White uh, recruits, or produced reports about lynching created magazines called The Crisis. So this is something the black community had to do for themselves. They had to pick themselves up and fight because no one would fight for them. Here's an uh, African-American woman at Howard University doing a really powerful protest, walking outside DC with nooses around their neck. You know, progressive heroes like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, he did nothing for lynching, literally nothing. His wife, Eleanor, supported anti-lynching bills. He didn't want to lose the Southern votes. He didn't want to piss off the South, so he decided not to do anything about this. So when did lynching end? It took the civil rights revolution, it took a cultural revolution, but lynching started to end when we started putting to death the lynchers. The last lynching in America, 1981, Michael Donald, killed by members of the KKK who wanted to instill fear in the black community. Here's the difference in 1981. This man was arrested, charged with a crime, and killed by the state, executed, 1997. The year after he was executed, this man, John William Bill King, a white supremacist, kidnapped a black man named James Burt Jr., tied him to the back of his truck, drove for a couple of miles, and brutally killed him. Something had changed. He was arrested, charged with a crime, and he was put to death in 2019, this year. I think about the person that put the needle into his arm to give him the lethal injection. They would have seen a tattoo on his arm of a tree and a black man hanging from that tree. The age of lynching is over. The great age of lynching in the United States of this racial terrorism is over but we still have legacies of lynching. We still have legacies of white supremacy. A lot, uh, we have a lot of issues in this country. Police shootings, criminal justice system, Charlottesville. We know that white supremacists are still out there. They're trying to make a comeback. My first semester at American University, the very first black student president was elected only to wake up the next morning to nooses outside of her room. The noose is making a comeback as a symbol of terrorism. The African American Museum in DC has had nooses left inside and outside of the building. I want to leave you with, with one way. I have this question of this presentation. How should we be remembering this and should we be remembering this? And I want to show you how these people are remembering the lynching that took place in 1946 in Georgia. 1946 in Georgia, two African American couples were brutally murdered. Two husband and wife. One of them was a World War II veteran, and one of them was seven months pregnant. Both of them were, were taken out of their cars by a white mob, and they were killed. No one was ever charged with a crime. It's called the Morris Ford Massacre. Ever since 2005, every single year, activists go back to the exact spot where this lynching took place, and they recreate the lynching. They reenact the entire lynching. They have men playing the lynchers, they take them out of their cars, they beat them, they have guns with blanks, and they shoot them, they take the baby out of the womb, all of it. It's all a recreation every single year since 2005, these activists do that, to draw attention to this, to draw attention to the fact that no human was ever charged with a crime in these murders, even though we know who committed them. So my question is, is this the right way to be remembering this history? How should we be remembering this history? What should we do about this? Equal Justice Initiative says suffering must be engaged, heard, recognized, and remembered before a society can recover from violence. I absolutely agree. That's why I've been giving this presentation to you today, and I'll just leave you with one last thought. If we can't deal with white supremacy in the past, how are we supposed to deal with it in the present? Thank you. And I, there are some note cards around. If you have any thoughts about this history, about whether or not we should be talking about this, putting up memorials, I would really appreciate it. You don't got to write your name. If you can put them outside as you're moving out there. If anybody's got to leave, you can leave. Or if anybody has any questions, or, uh, we can stay and talk afterwards. But thank you so much.